I'm Britt Udison, Executive and Artistic Director at the Loft Literary Center. Welcome to this live stream at Virtual Wordplay. I'm so glad you're here with us. Before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about what brought us here today. For the last year, the Loft staff has been working hard to put together an outdoor book festival that would have gathered 100 authors with 10,000 visitors in our neighborhood in downtown Minneapolis. As COVID-19 hit, we knew we had to think about everything we do differently, especially this festival. While we were disappointed that we wouldn't be able to gather in person, we became even more committed to supporting writers, celebrating new books, and finding new ways to assert the connective power of the written word. In a time of anxiety, we want to offer a powerful event for readers, writers, and booksellers. When we first approached our sponsors, their first question was, what is a virtual festival? And to be honest, we didn't know. Our founding partners, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune, agreed to make a leap of faith with The Loft. With courage, generosity, and vision, they have worked alongside us to figure out what this virtual festival might become. We are grateful to our sponsors and donors. Their generosity is incredible, but it is not enough. We believe it is essential, especially during a health and financial crisis, to offer programs that are free and accessible to all. But that has led to a significant revenue loss. A live event would have included ticket revenue, beer sales, exhibitor fees, and additional sponsorships. The loft is not closed. We continue to offer classes, fellowships, conversations, support for readers and writers in addition to this festival. We are here to support the literary community and we ask that you continue to support us. If you are able, please consider making a contribution to the loft today. Thank you for being here. Hello. Hello. My name is Lori Herzl. Welcome to the Loft Literary Center's Word Play. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this event, which would be St. Catharines University and the Star Tribune, my employer. Today, I will be talking with author Charles Finch, author of The Last Passenger, that's his most recent book. Um, in partnership with the National Book Critics Circle, um, I'm the president, Charles is a board member, and winner of our Criticism Prize, the Nona Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing. So welcome, Charlie. Thank you so much. And for those of you who don't know, Lori is a towering figure in, in our <laughs> world of criticism. So I'm so honored to be chatting with you today. And I love what The Loft has put together. So it's just exciting to be here. This is, this is an amazing virtual event. Um, this was supposed totally. to be a one day in person thing. And instead, it's like all day every day for weeks. It's <laughs> great. So this is this is really fun. And I'm really glad to be able to ask you some questions about your, your really good book, because um, I did, you know, as I was reading it, I was just thinking, okay, well, first, would you just say a little bit for people about the, um, the Charles Lennox series? which is um, a course, series of yeah. mysteries set in Victorian London, yeah. Yeah, exactly. They are, um, there are 13 of them now and they are all featuring the same protagonist, but the three most recent ones go back in time to when he was really young and just starting out as a detective in sort of the mm -hmm. 1850s. Um, and I'm a little sad to see the end of this trilogy of prequels because it was, I, you know, I had written 10 books in the main sequence of books and I, I really enjoyed that. But um, this this really energized me and gave me like a new perspective on the character. And so I'm, I'm a little sad to see them go, but I'm, I'm now back into writing in the main timeline and that's fun too, so. Oh, so there are going to be more books. Yes, sorry. Oh, good, at least, okay. At least a couple more. Um, and then what are, I'm, I'm doing such a poor job answering the question, let me think. Uh, the books are like, they're kind of mysteries and they have usually a mystery element. Uh, I don't know, Lori, help me. What, what, what are they about? Well, they're historical. I mean, one thing that struck me when I was reading this book was the level of detail was just amazing. And it really did make me feel like I was, it was almost like watching Masterpiece Theater. I mean, you could see where they were. You could see what they were wearing. You could see how they walked. Um, and then you have this wonderful, wonderful habit of dropping in really interesting little details into the middle of a sentence, you know, just sort of observations or little weird facts. And so I felt like I was learning so much as I was reading 
this book. So I wanted to know, one of the things I wanted to know is, of course, about your research, which must be absolutely prodigious. But also, um, before we get to that, if you could just go back and talk about how these books began. Um, oh, your like, love affair with uh, a place you've never been, which would be Victorian London. Well, what's really funny is, so I wrote the first one when I was, I think, 23 or so, 24. And uh, 20, 22. Wait, you were 23? Mm -hmm. oh, my gosh yeah. okay so well, you just I, came out of the shoot like <clears throat> great because that book was like lauded everywhere oh well thank you it but, was <laughs> i mean what's what's funny in retrospect is that i was working on something else and it was um like torture and i was just sort of eking out a page a day and trying to be disciplined and stuff and then i sat down one day and i started writing about victorian england and it felt so natural and i felt mm. so at home and i looking back i think like everyone has in their adolescence a way of like getting through the days. Like even if you're the captain of the football team or whatever, which I was not, um, you, you have, some people have comic books or you might have a pet or whatever. And for me, I would come home from school and later boarding school and I would just drop my bags and I would just start reading. Like I, I read a lot of Sherlock Holmes and George Eliot and Elizabeth Gaskell and mm -hmm. Woodhouse. So I had this whole, life in England in my mind from my adolescence and it was so effortless to go back there and in a way I have just sort of stayed in that mind space ever since even though I've subsequently like lived in England and, and done a lot of on the ground research as you say and stuff so that's kind of the genesis is just it, it grew out of reading and you know people always say to me like did you decide to become a writer because of x or y or z and I realized that I was lying for a long time because I used to say well yes when I was like 10 or 11 I started writing but I think it's always just been continuous. Like my life as a reader and as a writer, I'd be curious mm -hmm. for you as a critic. I mean, my life as a reader and my life as a writer are not as distinct maybe as I once tried to mm -hmm. say they were. I think maybe it's just always one's grown out of the other. And so loving to read that particular set of books helped me to write these books. Well, that I think that's really interesting, um, especially the you know you're writing this book when you were so young. You were living in London at the time, or you were at Oxford, yeah, I, right? I no, so I'd never been to England until I wrote the third book. I wrote the third, and so yeah, so it was. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, that's so. When you got there, was it was it a disappointment, or was it this feeling of like, yes, these are all the places that I saw in my brain? More of the second. I was definitely, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was definitely really enchanted. At the same time, you don't like, I mean, there is kind of a costume drama element to England in our minds here in America, which they resent, <laughs> maybe rightfully. But so that some of that fades away when you actually move to England. But for me, no, I, yeah, I, I was walking around Hampton Court or something like that. I still fully felt the like magic of like what had sort of drawn me in so deeply as, as a, a teenager. Um, and then, no, I was living in, uh, I was actually living for a summer in Washington, D.C. My, yeah, and I was just um, idling away and then I just started writing about Victoria. Yeah, it was very strange in retrospect, but it also makes sense to me, so I don't know. Well, I think if you're in Washington, D.C. in the summer, getting <laughs> away to Victorian England might be really, really nice. <laughs> Exactly. It's like so, a minute winter. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the character of Charles Lennox, I cannot help but notice he has your first name. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I just noticed that. Is, this it, is, is there the president of a critics association? <laughs> <laughs> I noticed those those small details. So why is that? Is he you? Is he based on you? Are you based on him? That would be even better. Oh, am I based on him? That's very yeah. like Paul Oster or something. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I always think, I mean, I guess I'll, the name thing I'll answer first. I, so I was originally thinking I would write it under a pseudonym, as a lot of people do with a mystery novel. Mm -hmm. um, and then my mom called me and she was like, can you just please publish it under your name so that I can show it to my friends? Oh, I that's said, sweet. I hung up on her and said, no. no. <laughs> I, Mom, um, I said I gave in, and but it was too late at that stage. They had done all the marketing materials and stuff, so the, the character's name, which I had made Charles to like wink to my friends, like oh, it's yeah. 
So now I seem like a narcissist, which I am <laughs> not for that reason. <laughs> um, no, you're you just know, winking to everybody now. <laughs> <laughs> and then the character, I mean, I always think of, I, I once read an interview with um, Haruki Murakami, which was so great because he said, uh, when I think of my protagonist, I try to imagine a man or a woman who was my twin at birth and then was um, taken away and taken to a totally different city. It became like a chef or an accountant or a journalist or something. And that's my protagonist. So they're like me in every respect. Oh. Different. And that's how I feel about Lennox is like his internal workings and his movements are, are my own, but I tried to have him be my twin in 18. Do I sound crazy? No, but I see another book. <laughs> kind of a time traveling, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the research seems absolutely meticulous. And I'm so surprised to hear that you were not even in England for the first three books. That's amazing to me um, because you describe it so vividly and so well. Um, so besides reading Mrs. Gaskell and these other writers, um, how did you do the research long distance? Yeah, um, you know, it's always been, I, I, after I think my fourth or fifth book, I got a letter from a, I wish I could remember where she was from. I, she was a reference librarian and I think she was from like maybe Omaha. Anyway, it was like a, a, a long letter and it said, he, it was maybe a Word document of like five pages and it said, here are all the mistakes from your first <gasps> four books. Are you kidding? <laughs> and I actually, I was kind of grateful for that because some people are really sticklers and that's good. But then the next day I got an email that said, it was from her again and it said, have you attended to this yet? <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to write back and say, I, mean, I, barely, I barely managed to drink a cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> Give me 10 minutes. But I mean, I've, it's telling in a way because I've never been like a, some writers have to be super anchored in facts. And I get facts wrong. <clears throat> I think in every book, at least a few. And then mm -hmm. I get the same things about them over and over, over the years. Um, so for me, what really matters is atmosphere. That's what, like, what I live and die mm -hmm. by as a reader. Like, if I don't feel like I'm in the right atmosphere, um, that's what matters. So I do a ton of research based on, like, this book, for instance, has a subplot about America. And so I read a lot yes. about what was America like in the 1850s? What were the political issues people cared about? Did people anticipate the Civil War? I mean, I got really interested in abolitionism in England, which has its own fascinating history. So there's a lot of specific research like that, but I almost always start by going back to one of those books I mentioned or one of those writers I mentioned and getting my ear in tune with the time. So right now I'm mm -hmm. in middle March, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, just as sort of like a way to get. So I've always, I always think of that as the more important research and then the rest I just fill in the facts. The other thing I really love is um, old newspapers. Uh, oh, okay. Victorian newspapers, were there. each one of them is like its own short story collection, it'll be like a personal ad being like, well, a very fine gentlewoman with an elegant nose who was seen walking at Charing Cross Station, please contact a lonely bachelor. I mean, there are these really <laughs> like evocative, and they have all the place names and stuff like that. So it really gets you into a lot of rabbit holes that are like productive for me at least. Mm -hmm. So since you started writing these books, how many times have you been back to England? Wow, so I lived there, um, between 2010 and, and 12, I want to say. I don't, I'm trying to remember, 2009 and 12. And mm -hmm. um, I've been back maybe four or five other times. And I try to, my favorite thing to do is really to just go, go around London and get lost because inevitably you see some blue plaque of like, a, you know, X lived here and you find out it was like someone who kept a pet cheetah during the <laughs> <laughs> And then you're suddenly reading... That's, so I, I try to just get lost and wander around London and go into shops and, and look in old doorways and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. uh, I feel like that adds like a richness to my experience of writing it, which I hope is transmitted in the books. I don't know. Oh, it is. I mean, like I said, they're, they're so vivid. Um, but also, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the politics because there is a whole layer of politics to this new book. Totally. Um, and... American politics, English politics, slavery, the slave trade, but but maybe I'm reading into this, but it felt like there were echoes of what's going on today um, with the um, 
tremendous greed. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the people who seem to have no moral code, <laughs> no moral center. Um, how, does, how, how does your life in this century of, you know, influence what you're writing about? It, I mean, I think it's such a, a great question. It's, it, you know, I, it's so rarely the case for me that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between what I'm experiencing and what I'm writing, but I think it's the ambience around me is always um, part of whatever book I'm writing. Um, and so, you know, at the start of the series, we were in a lot of these wars and stuff, and I think I wrote about more soldiers and stuff. And so there's always, and in this case, I, I mean, I, I think the tension right now is so overwhelming <laughs> between factions of society. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about the 1850s and sort of this young man trying to get ahead um, from a sort of a genteel background, but maybe not like uh, whatever. And, you know, what would he have thought about um, American society? I wanted to, I mean, I really wanted to start thinking about like, well, what would American, because I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I hope and don't think we're on the course to a civil war, but it has the same feeling of, um, I always think of Francis Bacon, the scholar said, war is like the exercise of, uh, or the heat of exercise and civil war is like the heat of fever, which I always, mm. thought, I don't know if it's true about war. I mean, you can leave that to one side, but it, it, there is something feverish about the atmosphere in America back then and about the atmosphere in America now, maybe. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think I did want to write about that maybe behind my own back, which is often how these things go. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask, um, about how you came to structure this book. Because I'm really fascinated by mystery writers because there are some mysteries where you can kind of see or you can figure it out. And there's others where, you know, they are so cleverly plotted that it it's a mystery till the end. This I thought was really cleverly plotted, but it didn't feel when I got to the end like, oh, that's not fair. You know, I didn't know this, but I mean, I could have put it all together, but I'm not smart enough. Um, Oh. <laughs> so, no, I, so the book opens with this this man has been killed on a train and all of the labels have been cut out of his clothes, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, and the story goes from there. Um, so do you sketch all this out beforehand and, and link all the pieces together or do you just write and see what happens? I wish I were like, um, you know, P.D. James, who wrote that great series for so long, and then she wrote Children of Men. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> she used to plot out her stories in advance so meticulously that she could then just wake up in her manner and, and um, say, I feel like writing chapter 31 today. Just, oh. that's cool. so he, oh she, I, I can't do that. I have to do a mix of like planning and then um, you know, driving down the road and seeing which way it turns a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. The real trick I've learned that it took me five or six books to learn is that if you write a very short, brief story at the outset of the process that just explains everything about the murder, and then that's everything you omit from your narrative. So it, it explains like who did it, how, when, why, and those are the puzzle pieces you take out of the puzzle until you can't make out the image. And gradually you add them back one by one in the hopes that the reader will sort of start to make out a fuzzy image of like, oh, maybe it was this person for this reason. Uh -huh. uh, and so that's that kind of like withholding the initial information, that's made it easier to do the plotting. That's really interesting. And do you then put in little red herrings to kind of lead the reader in the wrong direction deliberately? Like, um, <clears throat> the man who was stealing things from the right. different places. It's like, oh, maybe he's a bad guy. No, wait, he can't yeah. be a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is I went through a, a phase of listening to um, a true, this true crime podcast called My Favorite Murder, which is kind of silly, but it's also kind of wonderful. And um, in it, I noticed that there were always these like side crimes. It would be like at the same time in the neighborhood, there was someone stealing VCRs. And mm -hmm. so I was like, I've, it's funny you ask that because I very consciously in the last couple of books was like, you know, that's funny how there are always other crimes going on around it. And that's a much more natural red herring than having, you know, something a little bit more manufactured where it's uh -huh. like, well, they had a motive to want her dead. What, which one of them actually did it? You know, like, right, right. I thought that would be a more naturalistic way of creating, dive, uh, you know, sort of like distractions and red herrings for the reader. But I don't know. 
So do you drop them in like on the second draft or are you, you're, how many drafts do you do? Oh, that's a good question. I do a very careful, uh, I mean, I, I would almost consider it like three drafts in one because I read it three times as I'm going, but it would mm -hmm. count as one draft in terms of like A to point A to point Z. Does that make sense? So I, I go back mm -hmm. and I go through it. And so if I'm on chapter 19, I'll probably start again on chapter 16, rewrite all the way through to 19. And then right. there's, there's a great Hemingway thing about how you always have to know what your first sentence the next day is going to be. So I always mm -hmm. try to like, you know, keep that, um, keep a little momentum in reserve for tomorrow. But right. yeah, it's less a process of draft. And then I do a thorough edit. So I guess the answer is either two or four, or I don't know. Was that too, oh, the, <laughs> too confounding an answer? <laughs> yes. I'm speechless. <laughs> no, I, I'm never speechless. Yeah. So there's 13 Lennox books. Yeah. So so you're you're writing your books and you start with what was the first one, which was, wait, I have it written down. A beautiful blue death. Is that right? I don't think that, anyone's I don't think anyone's read them all, including my family. So don't worry about it. Yeah. I hope you've read them all. So you start writing them and you get to 10 books and then you decide to go back in time and do this trilogy or pre what would you call it? A pre trilogy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> a prequel prequel right. trilogy. So I, why did you decide to do that? That's a very unusual thing to do, I should tell you. It is, yeah, totally. Um, you know, yeah, it was a it's hard to explain and it's hard to um, describe what it is, but then when you're in reading the series, hopefully it makes sense. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'd done 10 and the, the last one, the first ones are difficult for me to even like look at the spines now because I had so little idea what I was doing. Like the first one, um, which people, I understand, I mean, people still tell me they like it and stuff, but I sure. didn't know who the murderer was till page 250. I, I was like, oh my God, I have to figure out who did it. <laughs> so, wow awful nerve-wracking way to write a murder mystery that I can <laughs> I woke up in the cold sweat being like wait what am I <laughs> you know so I feel like only in the last four or five books of that initial set of 10 did I really have any grip on what I was doing I mean you know being a writer is like being learning to hit a backhand or poach eggs it's like you get better the more you do it Mm -hmm. By 10, which was a book called The Inheritance, I thought this is about as good as I can do. Maybe I'll just stop here. That was my favorite one that I'd done. Mm -hmm. And um, my editor was like, well, I'll take a little time and think it over. And then he was like, well, what do you think about, you know, maybe writing a different era? And I said, no, I don't think so. But immediately in my mind, <laughs> I had like 12 ideas. And by the next day, I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. And I didn't want to do just one prequel because I sometimes feel like with those people try to cram in every character who's been in the series and they try to, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like it has, you know, breathing room in it. I wanted them to be like a real portrait of his evolution over these younger um, years. Um, so that's sort of a roundabout answer, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy with what it became. I always loved the magician's nephew when I was little, the CS. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like, you can either read it first or you can read it in sequence how he wrote it. And, I feel like that about these, like they can sort of stand apart or you can read them in sequence with the others. And so, yeah, I really enjoyed them. So are the other characters based on anybody or are they totally figments of your imagination? I'll tell you something funny. No matter who the murderer is, my dad calls and said, says, I loved it, but I don't know why you based the murderer on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see some issues here. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I think he's just like, <laughs> he's, you know. Um, no, I, I, I have a tough time writing direct. It's sort of like what I was saying about, um, writing from life. Like I have a tough time writing direct. Um, but I, I definitely magpie little bits of, um, character and, and traits and, and stuff like that from various people. Um, I, but I can't remember ever writing someone who was just like X is Y. Mm -hmm. So Lady Jane is not based on anyone in particular? No, she's maybe based on what I dreamed um, romance would be like when I was 14 or something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, That's also, pretty cool. I'm ha very happily married, so I, I, <laughs> you know, I came true a little bit. So would you talk a little bit about your writing process? Do you write every day? Do you write in the same place every day? Do you have to have yellow roses in the room like Truman Capote? <laughs> what? I never knew that about him. That's amazing. Uh -oh. 
Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if it's true, but he said it in, in the Paris Review. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say it's true. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I used to be, I used to be both much uh, more disciplined and less productive. Like I would really beat myself <laughs> up if I hadn't done anything that day. And now I'm more accepting that there are days where I'm maybe just going to read and you kind of let the crops rotate in your mind. I mean, your experience as a critic must be the same. Like sometimes you put something in a drawer and yeah. So, so I sure. try, to, try to work every morning and I try to, you know, I don't think anyone can write for more than like three or four hours without their brain turning into pudding. So I'm like by noon, I'm like really dazed and out of it, but I try to get in those few hours. And then the next day I see if it's any good in the afternoon, I maybe will read or do some, critical writing or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And then I have let days go now in a way I didn't before. And I actually think it makes the whole process quicker, which is kind of strange. I wish I'd known that earlier when I was forcing myself to do 500 words a day or whatever it was. The it's quicker in that the, the days that you write, you're writing because you really want to and you're inspired or? I don't know if inspiration is quite the right word because I think people, there's that E.B. White thing, like the writer who waits for inspiration will never set pen to paper. Right. Um, yes. So I definitely try to have, you know, I, I try to work every day, but I accept now that there are days where it's not going to be, where just I'm working on something, working through something in terms of the plot or a character, like why is a character in this position? <clears throat> so I try to be as disciplined in terms of dedicating time to it, but I'm more forgiving of myself. And I think that is what makes it quicker. Whereas if I was just trying to hammer out, you know, a certain number of words every day, regardless, I would often end up deleting thousands of them because they weren't the mm -hmm. right. They didn't come from a place where I was actually like creating anything. They were just done out of a sense of duty. Um, so. Do you write on a computer? I write, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I write the ends of all the books on a computer and in the other stuff I write a mix. Like if it's going really quickly and well, I'll write on a computer. If it's a little slower, I will maybe go longhand and try to puzzle it out longhand, which is just another trick to force hmm. myself to look at it in a new way or something. That's interesting. Yeah. So you write some of it in longhand and some of it when you're really when you're really cooking with gas, you switch to the computer? Yeah, sometimes that would drive me crazy to write longhand. But if it's like something yeah. where I'm like trying to puzzle out, you know, a motivation or a, a a part of the crime that is not clear to me yet totally i'll do i'll switch to longhand and then type it in so do you read a lot of mysteries or do you want to stay away from mysteries because you don't want to accidentally absorb one this sounds so so terrible well, maybe i shouldn't say it. no it sounds terrible oh, yeah. i've I, I read fewer mysteries than i used to because i think i've now cycled through the possibilities in my head so much that i am like a spoil sport like i I'll be watching NCIS with my wife's family and I'll just say, well, that guy did it. I mean, it <laughs> and they'll all get mad and say, no, he didn't. Why do you think he did it? And, you know, he did. It's just because after you see a certain number of mysteries, so I'm just pickier. Like I really love mm -hmm. Todd French and Louise Penny and mm. um, there, are, there are mysteries I just don't miss, but I sadly, you know, it's like a busman's holiday. I read fewer mysteries for pleasure now than I used to when I was starting out. So you mentioned your critical writing. Would you talk about that a little bit? Um, what you do and who you do it for? And why not the Star Tribune? <laughs> I've never been asked. Are you kidding? Ah, well. <laughs> uh, no, I, um, let me think. I, yeah, I write a lot of book criticism, <clears throat> mostly about literary fiction, actually, not mystery mm -hmm. much. Um, and for places like the New York Times and the Washington Post and Slate and uh, The Guardian, and um, it was just something I did because of actually the mysteries. A, an editor at USA Today, Jocelyn McClurg, who's a great editor, said, would you ever want to write like a quick review? And I reviewed a Joe Nesbo book. And I just, it mm. sort of reopened a dormant part of my mind from when I was a student. And I loved being able to just like, you know, Virginia Woolf has a great quote about how with a piece of criticism on like with a novel, you can really spear the eel right in the middle. It's like, you can really nail it. And so sometimes if you have like 900 words, you can really say like, okay, this is what, you know, Salman Rushdie's really trying to do. And this is what he's about. And I love that feeling of like completeness because with a novel, it's more, much more like, well, see what you make of this dream I had, you know, it's, right, it's, right. So it's different parts of my personality. But see, that's what I'm wondering is how you go back and forth between the two, because 
I mean, for, for my job, I'm a writer and an editor. And it's, it's hard to go, you know, from editing brain, which is certainly quite different from writing brain, even though they both involve words. Um, so to go from creating in the morning with your own writing to critiquing in the afternoon, um, you have to take a, a long walk in between or something, right? To definitely, definitely long walks. And also, you know, I mean, I think it has had a, a it's, it's made writing fiction harder because, you know, I've just seen so many novels fall for various reasons, you know, which you mm -hmm. just, you know this better than I do. As a critic, you just see a lot of things that have a lot of virtues fail. And mm -hmm. there have definitely been moments um, in the past, you know, five years where I was paralyzed by that. Um, and the critical part of my brain overtook the sort of more creative part of my brain or the part that, I mean, that's the eternal dilemma is polish versus spontaneity. Because if you polish a book to death, you can sort of kill the idea that that created it. And that's in, mm -hmm. in a way the good fortune of writing a series because I'm sort of like, I'm working to a schedule and I have to produce a book and people want to read it at a certain time every year. And so I kind of have to write freely, which is a nice thing. Are you, you're writing one a year? Yes, yeah. Yeah, year. boy, that's, that, that just seems like such a pace. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been... Later, so. Well... It, it has been great talking with you. I think Steph Opitz is going to join us now with questions hey. from the virtual world. Hi, Steph. Hi. Um, I just have to say that, um, Charlie, when you said um, you don't think anybody's read all of your books, like so many people in the chat about this commented, I've read them all, I've read them all, I've read them all, I've read them all. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. Uh, you That's are great. wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and... I know I said I wouldn't do a comment more than a question for you, but here's one. <laughs> Char, it's just, I, it's, it's good. Um, this is from Ben Ryder. Oh, okay. uh, reader. Uh, Charles, huge, huge fan here. Less of a question and more of a request based off your excellent recent LA times quarantine diary. One, can you do a brief guitar performance? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and two, can we end with a ceremonial candle lighting? <laughs> oh, God. I actually know Ben Reader. He's a friend of mine. So I'm going to do counts. But thank him for tuning in and thank him for the question. Maybe um, you guys could schedule a little Zoom later for that. Yeah, exactly. I <laughs> well, this is what I, so my, in my LA Times piece, I was saying it's very humiliating. I've like become a candle person. The quarantine. <laughs> me a candle which I was always like well that's just a waste of time and now I find it extremely like soothing <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> so he's, uh, yeah. um, somebody else had asked about your unexpected pleasures of uh, the quarantine so I would direct them to your LA Times piece because sure, it does, right. yeah <laughs> on Netflix it's a very soothingly paced slow Japanese reality show hmm. all right um Everyone is asking about what is coming up next. What's the next book? Can you give us any previews, yeah. that sort of thing? Absolutely. Um, the um, the next book, I'm 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 working on it right now, and so I'm like, I don't I don't totally know. I'm in that phase where I'm. It could be one of two things, but the gist of it is that the main detective in the series, Charles Lennox, goes to America for the first time. Um, oh. He has to go for sort of governmental reasons. And then there's surprise, surprise, a murder mystery that uh, sort of unfolds. Um, and a lot of it's going to take place in sort of like Edith Wharton's New York and Newport, that kind of milieu. Um, so a lot of maybe money motivations and stuff. Um, it's been incredibly fun to research. I don't know if, Lori, if you've read a lot about that time. I've never read about the sort of Consuelo Vander Vanderbilt types and stuff mm. like that. It's, it's fun to dive into. Um, I just want to quickly say while I'm thinking of it, if you look down here, there's a buy it now button for Charlie's latest book and the others. So definitely use that. We were, it's very important at Loft Wordplay to be supporting authors by buying their books. Um, so a question yeah, from independent bookstores for sure. It's from independent bookstores. The link is, um, definitely we're supporting indies. Um, I don't, we're working with a few different ones, so I can't remember who is doing this particular one, but it's either Moon Palace, Milkweed, 
uh, Red Balloon, or Majors of Quinn, or bookshop.org. Um, yeah. Rick Tucker has a question. Have you ever jointly written a story with another author, or would you? Oh, what a great question. Um, no, the answer is no. I don't. I think it'd be really tough. I I would like to do it in epistolary form, like a novel in letters, I think could be really fun between two writers. Um, the actual idea of like, writing is very private and personal in a weird way. And in a way it's where I feel like most myself. So mm -hmm. that would be a very vulnerable thing to do with someone else, but I would love to someday, yeah. Um, it would have to be exactly the right thing. Um, but that's a great question, Rick, thank you. Yeah, it's something I think about a lot, so. Um, there's a lot of questions that I'm trying to find. Oh, here it is. Um, this question is from John Gold. How do you decide what food and drinks to use in your books? Do you sample them first? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you, John. Um, I, you know, I have been accused of putting too much food and drinks in my books. Uh, I always found it comforting at at like alarming moments when I was reading children's books and they would stop and have like, you know, a, a nice meal or something to eat. It just felt like, I don't know, a little respite. So I've always liked that balance of a little bit of danger and then some comfort. Um, and I, yeah, I, I put a lot of thought into what they eat. I, I, uh, I'm trying to source a, a really top notch Victorian Welsh rarebit uh, recipe. A lot of them involve almond paste, which is not how I've ever seen it. Right? <laughs> so yeah, I, I put a lot of thought into that and into the tea they drink and stuff like that. So, and I, I try to sample, yeah, yeah. I should sample less, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, this question is from Erica Storm. She said, if I'm doing my maths correctly, there are about 10 years between the last passenger and a beautiful blue death. I probably don't have to point out that there's plenty of room for more prequels, but aside from that, do you have thoughts on how the two timelines um, will match up? Well, first of all, I remember Erica vividly from um, my trips to Milwaukee. So Erica, it's so nice of you to tune in. Thank you. Um, Erica has always like come out and supported the books ever since maybe 2010 or so. So it's nice to see you on here. Um, I have thought a lot about that space and whether I'd ever want to write something maybe a novel that takes place over several years um, about his sort of like early to mid career. Um, it's a, there's, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Yes. The answer is yes. And, and I have a lot of ideas, but none that are really specific or interesting. So perfect for this forum. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Do you, this, this question is from John Stolen. Do you like rowing and horseback riding like Lennox? Oh, wow. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Well, I will tell a story about my horseback riding career, which is that I was forced to do it when I was a kid. <laughs> and every year I came in literally last place in every event in the horse regatta. Lori, you're a wordsmith. What's it called? Uh, not, I'm not a horsesmith, though. So, I would, except I would always get the blue ribbon in naming the parts of the horse, which was a written test. <laughs> so I'd have to go up to the like the state, everyone else would be getting it for like best seat, best whatever. So I'm not a horse person. I do love to um, pun, which is sort of like very low key rowing. Um, and I've sculled a few times as Lennox does, but um, I just wanted to really give a sense of him as a physical person. Sometimes I think that gets lost because it's also in his head. And so I was thinking, let's give him like a sport or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, hmm. um, I don't know who this question is from because it came from our Facebook page, but um, do you have some type of physical London map for Victorian times to help you navigate the city? Oh yeah. Great question. I have several books that are, you know, sort of like um, guides, city guides, which have like the names of like restaurants, all the restaurants have Italian names, which I find really funny. And I kind of leave that out of the books because I, uh, I'm not sure people would <laughs> like buy it. It's one of those real details that, uh, but they're all called like Lombardies or whatever. Anyway, um, so yeah, I have, I have those books. And then I have um, 
I have a couple of online resources that I really like, which show in detail what houses looked like back then. And you can kind of get street views. People have pieced that together. So yeah, there's a lot of really good stuff out there. Um, this question is from Laura Gentry. Gentry, um, Was it hard for you to work in your fans' names into The Last Passenger? Was it weird since some of the names didn't fit the era? Oh, great question. Uh, well, Laura is someone I, who I've also, I've run in, met in Wichita, uh, I believe at Watermark, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, but who's another longstanding reader. So I'm so grateful to you for, uh, for tuning in today. Um, it was awful. Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> at a contest and it was like, you can get your name in the book and then everyone's name turned out to be like, not very British, which is, <laughs> I mean, which is great. I mean, it's a melting pot and everything, but um, you try. I, I did a lot of like Polish counts and stuff. I was like, a, a mysterious Polish count was visiting, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, this question is from Mary Truett, which I feel like might be a relative. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, any other period of history you're attracted to writing about? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm really interested in um, sort of Amer America around um, the early part of the 20th century. That's what I'm thinking a lot about. <coughs> but I don't have a, yeah, I don't have a good idea yet, but that's something I'm reading about. Like, I really am interested in um, the South during the 20s and 30s. Hmm. Yeah, so maybe one day. Um, this is another question from Facebook. Um, a beautiful Blue Death audiobook hooked me to your series. How was the reader selected for your audiobooks? Do you have any involvement in that? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, so this, they, yeah, they, they initially, uh, at that very first book, sent, I think, five audio samples, and I listened to two actors read the first chapter of the book, and I was like, oh, these guys are great. It's going to be so hard to choose. And then the third was the reader, James Langton, and I um, immediately was just like, oh, this is it. I barely, I mean, I listened to the other two just in case it happened again, but it was like night and day. I was just so pleased with how he had done it, and he's done it ever since, and I've never met him. I would like to have, take him out to lunch next time I'm in London, maybe. Um, this question is from Laura. <clears throat> how does it feel writing for Lennox? How does writing for Lennox feel now 10 plus books and compared to the first few novels when the series was in its infancy. Do you think about the process differently? Do you tire of any aspects of the series or world or does each mystery feel just as fresh to write as they do to read? That is such a great question. I mean, truly a great question. Let me think. You know, it's a, writing a series is like a long journey at close quarters. It's kind of like going around the Cape of Good Hope in a ship with 10 other people or something. Cause you, you do some, I sometimes do get sick of the characters or I move off of one character and then I get a lot of notes that are like, why wasn't Graham in this book? What, what happened? <laughs> and then I circle back, but ultimately it, you know, I feel, I feel like I, the, that problem really came to a head with the prequels. I was like, I was like, I've done this for long enough. I feel like I know how to do it. And now writing again in, in, the sort of main chronology of the series, I feel back to being excited and energized. So I've been fortunate, I guess. Yeah. I think we have um, time for maybe one more. Um, I don't want to pick a bad one. There's so many questions. <laughs> Not that there's no bad questions. There's just a lot of people very excited to ask um, questions. Um, well, can I say anyone who doesn't get their question answered, just ask me on facebook.com slash Charles Finch author. I have a thread going and I'll try to answer all of them. There and, you go. And before the last question, I just want to say thank you again to Lori who did such an amazing thing. I know at the, this is a very chill and relaxing time for journalists, Lori, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing anything. <laughs> exactly. And just as much to Loft. I mean, you guys are doing this on the fly and it's incredible and I'm just so grateful to be involved. So thank you, Steph. Oh, thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, this is, I mean, you talked about this a little bit with the um, My Favorite Murder podcast, but do you ever take inspiration from real life crime cases? Um, Great question. Yeah. Um, I don't. And I, I think it's because 
the crime for me is not the most interesting. I th- I feel like some people are really like crime focused when they write mystery novels, and some people the crime is like an excuse for the world to exist. And for me, the world of Lennox and his sort of people and what what he wants to do is is what's maybe primary. So I think I would feel kind of gross or something if I, you know, took the murder of a real life like kid and was, or whatever, and and tried to sort of just like do an analog um, to it in fiction. So no, I, yeah, I don't, I don't do that. I know some writers do to great, you know, success. Well, um, again, I want to remind everyone to buy Charlie's book in the link below. Um, and you can also find out about the rest of um, Loft's wordplay events coming up um, on, the, on the same button. Um, thank you to St. Catharines University and Star Tribune, our presenting sponsors, for making this happen. And the National Book Critics Circle, which I am a proud member of as well. Um, and thank you so much, Lori, for your time and Charlie for joining us and for all your wonderful books that you keep putting out. And I hope they're keeping a lot of people company during this kind of isolating time. Um, I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Charlie. That was so fun.